COVID-19 has emphasised the impact of obesity on health in the UK. The situation of people living with obesity is one of the biggest future health challenges we have. Their sickest patients are those under 60 who are obese. Even Boris Johnson was admitted to hospital with coronavirus. When I went into ICU, when I was really ill, I was, I was, I was very, I was way overweight. But this is not a new problem. Only one in three of us are a healthy weight. There have been 14 obesity strategies since 1992. But since then, obesity rates have almost doubled. Why is it that these different obesity strategies have failed? How can we change our approach before it's too late? I'm Dr. Rachel Batterham, Professor of Obesity at University College London. To put this into perspective, there are more 11 to 15 year old children with obesity in England than in the United States. And this situation is getting worse. We need to do something urgently. I'm going to meet with leading experts and visit people around the UK living with obesity to find out why we as a nation have such a problem with our weight. And in a month's time, I'm going to be taking my findings to a group of my peers and decision makers to discuss what needs to be done. You don't have to be a doctor to know that some people struggle with their weight. I want to ask the science community why that is. Hi, Sadaf. Hi, Rachel. Good to see you. Sadaf, I'm trying to understand why more and more people in the UK are affected by obesity. Does your research offer any insights into this for us? We've known anecdotally that there are some people who always struggle with their weight. There are some people who are very thin and can eat what they like and they don't put on weight. What we now can see is that it's genes that explain that difference between people in families. If you look at twins, identical twins have a 90% identical body weight as adults, even if they're separated at birth. There are clear drivers to obesity. The strongest evidence, to be honest, comes from genetics. There's an entire system for regulating our weight that has been uncovered through the discovery of different genes. And if any of those genes are faulty, then the system doesn't work and people gain a lot of weight. So weight genes are being discovered, explaining why we struggle with our weight. This is just one contributing factor, but it does explain why families follow the same weight trends. Being overweight can lead to many other diseases, like heart disease, cancer, and type 2 diabetes. What is the NHS doing to try and treat and prevent obesity from becoming a life-threatening problem? There has been a lot of emphasis probably too much emphasis on the personal responsibility angle. And I think we have to conclude that that approach alone is insufficient. Over the last few years, there has been a realisation that we spend a lot on, on health, and rightly so. Um, somewhere in the region, the NHS England annual budget is something like 130 or 140 billion per annum. If you look on what we have traditionally directed the money towards, the vast majority is reacting to what's in front of us. There are very real cases and powerful cases to be made of not just cost effectiveness, but cost saving, return on investment in the longer term through a focus on prevention. We launched the National Type 2 Diabetes Prevention Programme, the flagship prevention programme within the NHS. And we have very recently launched our digital weight management programme. It supports people through behaviour change to empower them to lose weight, exercise more and eat more healthily. A real positive step, referring people to evidence-based weight management services, which will improve their health rather than patients having to guess what to do on their own. But does this digital approach exclude some patients? Jonathan, is there a danger that digital lifestyle interventions will exclude people from the more deprived areas? So I think that's been a concern with digital modes of delivery uh, over some time now. 
reassuringly, actually, the dimensions of both deprivation and ethnicity did not in any way impact negatively on attendance. So all in all, that piece of work, the pilot that we did as part of the diabetes prevention programme, was pretty reassuring in that regard. I'm happy to see the diabetes prevention programme develop, but so many people don't even see putting on extra pounds as a medical problem to take to their GP because of how we view overweight and obesity as a society. Now I'm going to see Nadia, who, after her own lived experience, advocates for people living with obesity and for the eradication of weight stigma. Did any healthcare professionals ever talk to you about your weight or offer you any help? I remember when I was really worried about my weight, and this was when I was about 164 kilos, which is about 25 stone. I asked the GP if I could have some blood tests to be assessed for my health. And that GP said to me it wasn't important or necessary uh, to have these blood tests because it was only about my weight. And I consequently had those blood tests and to my horror, I found out I was pre-diabetic. I do believe that support is critical in this journey of losing weight. And I would have felt that it would have been really important to have the community involvement to reduce the stigma that is attached to losing weight. The Wirral, which is one of the most deprived areas of the UK, unsurprisingly has some of the highest obesity rates also. I sent Nadia to find out if community support can help in an area like the Wirral. Nadia is visiting a football league called Man vs Fat. Their slogan is, lose weight together. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice yeah. to meet you. Could you tell me a little bit more about Man vs Fat and, and what really it does? It's a football league, it's an FA accredited league. The idea is, is that we turn up, we get weighed, and if we've lost weight, we score half a goal. Have you found that it's, it's helped you in your weight loss and you've been losing weight? Yeah, I think we've all tried to lose weight every week, so we've got a good start before we even play the match. And we all turn up every week, we all lose weight in the main. There's a lot of lads who maybe have struggled with weight kind of like all their life and have been put off playing football. And it's a good way for them to kind of get back into it as well. I'm a dad of two children and I've recently moved to the Wirral like in the last few years. And I had no friends and it was a bit like, what can I do as a, as a 30 something year old man? And to get out and meet new friends and new people, it, doing something we all love, even though Alex sports Spurs, for example, <laughs> we're still mates. <laughs> Nicholas Pickering, one of the players from Man vs Fat, has kindly invited us to visit him and his family to talk about their own experiences and what they see as the causes of obesity in the Wirral. Oh, hi Rachel, nice to meet you. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you again. When I was about six years old, my parents separated. From that point, I started to gain quite a lot of weight. I didn't feel like I did do really well, lost a lot of weight, lost about six or seven stone. But then I haven't managed to maintain that. The last 10 years have been spent yo-yoing up and down. I went on holiday to Turkey, went for a horse uh, tr uh, trek, and at the end of it, you know, we were presented with the photograph that they'd taken, and this is me, me on the horse. When I got that back, that was the first time I'd actually seen myself in a photograph for a long time. When I saw that, that's when I knew that I'd have to do something about it. How did you go about it? Did you go to your doctor and say, I need to lose weight, can you help me? I had to take it upon myself, really, because I, I wasn't even aware there was any support. What I would do is, I was quite ashamed of my size and things. Obviously, I lived in my local area with a lot of those kids who I went to school with, and I didn't want them to see me running around and stuff, you know, my chest bouncing up and down and my sides jiggling, and all that kind of thing. I actually started to go running quite late at night down country lanes nearby, so I could go down there late at night 
it's still only, I'd say, in the last few years, I actually run that I've been able to run down main roads. People say, oh, you need to exercise. But when you do want to go out and exercise, they look at you and perhaps laugh and, and joke. In my own example, I was told to exercise and eat less. And I bravely went to the gym and I was laughed at in the gym um, because of my size. For me, obesity is a medical condition, the same as high blood pressure or diabetes. It makes sense to treat because we can and we can really improve people's health and make them live longer. I think now after have, after having you know having talking with yourselves, I would now maybe go and say, look, I've been yo-yoing for the last 10 years. Can you please help me stabilize, stabilize that, yeah. Nick and other people don't know where to turn for help and are often set back when their weight starts to be put back on. I'm suggesting Nick talks to his GP before he yo-yos again. But with GPs under increasing pressure, are they in a position to be able to support every patient with a weight problem? I'm going to visit Dr. Francis Berwier, a GP at Brondesbury Medical Centre in Kilburn. We have registered almost 21,000 patients here. Because we're on the Kilburn High Road, we are bordering Camden and Brent. We have quite significant pockets of deprivation all yeah. around the practice. Do you think that overweight and obesity are more common in people with social deprivation? Definitely. As well as social deprivation, it's also about um, access to healthcare and um, I think ethnicity. So when a patient joins your practice, then they have their BMI calculated. So that might be a sort of a chance to sort of flag this. When a patient comes in with a problem, I have 10 minutes to, to kind of ask about it, um, try and diagnose it, examine the patient and talk about what we're going to do and when we're going to meet again. It's really difficult as GPs to fit in around everything else that we have to do. There's a patient who was highlighted to me her BMI is 60. We're in a situation where it seems that nobody's had this conversation with her. So this is really quite worrying because this young lady has got severe obesity. So a BMI of 60 puts her in sort of the top one or 2% of the population in terms of her weight. We really need to do something different here. You're a new patient here and I've been looking through your records, checked your BMI and we noticed it was raised. I think probably the, the last time I went to the doctor before an adult was when I was about eight or nine. And every time they would mention that I'm overweight, never told my BMI, never said like, you should do this, you should do that. Now it's got to a point where I'm 30 and I'm like, you know, 28 stone. The higher your BMI, then the harder it is to lose weight because your body tries to go back to the highest weights that you've ever reached. When you go on a diet, you have changes in your hormones that then make it harder to lose more weight. Somebody with your BMI should be referred to specialist weight management. The reality is for you to get down to a BMI below 50 mm. through diet alone will be incredibly difficult without a huge amount of specialist support. Yeah. No one's ever said that to me. Yeah. And I'm like, well, it's actually kind of shocking almost, like, <laughs> yeah. As a GP within a practice, you know, this is making me think, goodness, we need to think about these things because we don't have other chairs in our waiting room. Do we have enough scales, for example? I had COVID in February um, and I ended up getting really ill and I had COVID pneumonia and sepsis, ended up in hospital. That's why I've got to this point now, so. You were really sick with COVID, and that is a direct consequence yeah. of the weight that you are. You really do need some specialist support because actually, on your own, it would be incredibly difficult, almost impossible. We need to intervene now in people like Katie before they've developed all the complications of obesity. We need to be more active and really make sure that GPs have the equipment and the knowledge 
to help people like Katie. We also need increased access to dedicated weight management clinics that people can self-refer to. At the moment, we only react often when it is too late, which ends up costing the NHS more money and many people their lives. One of England's most comprehensive weight management services is in Liverpool at Aintree University Hospital and it's run by Professor John Wilding. What we know from research is that even if you do a huge amount of physical activity on its own, without restricting the diet, that really doesn't result in very much weight loss at all. The key thing to help people lose weight is actually to restrict the energy intake. How is the NHS currently treating people with overweight and obesity? In Liverpool, uh, we have quite a comprehensive service. People with obesity have access to uh, a doctor, uh, a dietitian, physiotherapist, and in some cases, psychology and occupational therapy as well. For some individuals, we have access to medications. And then finally, we also have access to bariatric surgery. Today we're going to meet with uh, Ken Clare, who's a patient of mine who has had bariatric surgery, which has helped him quite a lot over the years with his weight. Hello, Ken, nice to see you. Somebody told me about your clinic and I came along. I didn't know what to expect and it was the first time that anyone had ever taken my weight seriously. I lived with obesity all my life, even from early childhood. That's me and my daughter. You can see in that picture that I'm in pain. We'd gone to uh, Euro Disney. She was running around the park, doing everything. I couldn't go on any rides. One of the things that upset me, the kids was shouting abuse at me about being large and fat. It was a horrible time. I decided to seek some help. I was made aware of a clinic at Aintree Hospital run by John Wilding. I got myself referred. Eventually, I was offered bariatric surgery. It was amazing. I think within the first three months, I lost six stone. I think it's important to point out that I don't think surgery is for everyone, but for those people who it's indicated for and who want it, I really think it should be far more accessible. I wouldn't want anyone to have to get to that like I did before they got the treatment they needed. With an operation like bariatric surgery, we would expect to, for most people to be able to lose maybe about uh, up to about a third of their body weight with the most effective operations. So it's a highly effective operation. The pounds or stones or kilos matter a lot, but what's really improved is my health, the quality of my life, and just the way that I've I've lived a lot longer and a lot better than I would have, I would have done because before surgery I was just in a terrible state. Ken's experience is just one of thousands, except he's one of the fortunate few who've actually been taken seriously by a doctor. In terms of treatment, I think uh, there's still a, a big gap because the, we know that there is at least a third of the country that doesn't have any access to uh, services for people with severe obesity. So what you're effectively saying is there's a postcode lottery in terms of accessing treatment for people living with obesity. I do think there's going to need to be quite a substantial investment in services over the next few years if we're really going to uh, be able to treat obesity as the serious disease that it is. I know Ken from the work that he's done for different charities. He's helped many people affected by obesity to access information and care. Do you think the NHS is doing enough for people affected by obesity? The short answer would be no. I think they're doing a great job, but I think there's got to be a lot more access to treatment. It's a huge problem, Rachel on lots of levels, in the media, from the public, some healthcare professionals, I'm sorry to say, and that all feeds in 
to internalised stigma. It's prevented me and many other people I know from seeking help. Speaking to Ken makes me feel that while many of the steps we're taking are positive, we're not moving fast enough. Part of the problem is that people with obesity are often blamed for their weight, but we know that one of the key reasons for weight gain is genetic. But the big question is, how does this help us manage patients in the future? I'm going to ask Professor Faruqi if she can answer this question for me. How is genetics going to impact on managing people with obesity? So we're finally beginning to see the potential of genetics uh, being realised for treatment for patients. So what we're already seeing is there are a few disorders where a particular gene is faulty and people definitely become very heavy from a young age. And we can now treat a number of those disorders because we understand how the gene is driving their weight problem. Now, what we're hoping is in the fairly near future, and we're talking about in the next couple of years, we'll be able to roll out those treatments to a broader group of people who have a major genetic contribution to their weight. A lot of people say that it's just simply eat less and move more. But genetics surely gives us the greatest argument against this. That's very true. There's clear evidence that in families, there are people who struggle with their weight, and then there are other families where people don't struggle with their weight and they can eat what they like uh, and they stay slim. And the reason that we differ is because of our genes. Who is the person who can have the greatest impact on obesity prevalence? Well, arguably, it's Chris Whitty, the Chief Medical Officer. So I'm going to see him to find out what he thinks are the solutions to reducing our obesity epidemic. A lot of people with obesity experience weight stigma, which is really detrimental to them psychologically and in terms of accessing healthcare. How do you think we can try and reduce weight stigma? Well, I think we have to be really clear. People should feel no embarrassment, no shame, no con you know, about uh, living with obesity. This is something which should be seen as a medical problem and a medical problem only. Uh, and anything which uh, in reinforces stigma, we should avoid at all costs when it comes to public health messaging, when it comes to the way as individual doctors and other health professionals we interact with people. Uh, seeing this as a stigmatizing problem is really detrimental medically as well as completely wrong. Is your sort of take home message that you think that we can actually reduce the levels of obesity going forward? It is something, and I, I really want to stress this, it is something which is not inevitable uh, and which we can improve. There's a, there's a concept in, in public health called the ladder of state intervention, where you start off with things which actually have uh, almost no intervention with state powers. So things like doing research and you move up a bit informing people move up a bit further, you're starting to engage with industry saying, look, really, could you help us with this? And then move a bit further up, things like nudge taxes and right the way through at the top of the range to banning things and making things impossible. And I think most people would say for, um, for obesity, we should be aiming to do things, lots of things, but at the lower end of that ladder of intervention. The sugar levy is a good example. This came in in 2018, and it was a relatively small additional levy for higher sugar fizzy drinks. When that came in, the amounts of sugar that were consumed went down substantially. Sales of the products didn't go down, but they went up. People got the drinks they wanted, but the number of calories went down. And so that's a situation where, in a sense, there are no losers. The thing uh, worked extremely well. That's an example of the kind of thing that government can do, but we need to do things all the way through the system. Uh, but certainly just saying it's personal responsibility uh, is doomed to fail. I'm going to present what we've learned so far about genetics, treatment, and the impact of deprivation and inequality on obesity to a group of my peers and decision makers. We're seeing the numbers of people affected by overweight and obesity increasing. So what can we do? The Royal College of Physicians called upon the government to establish a cross-government strategy to tackle health inequalities because this needs to impact on housing, employment, planning, transport and health. We all know somebody whose life 
is affected by obesity. But the vast majority of these people are unable to access any treatment for their condition. People with obesity experience stigma in every part of their life. Obesity is not lack of willpower. It is not personal responsibility alone. I mean, is this a problem for doctors and healthcare staff? The answer is yes. So is it a medical problem? Yes. Uh, is it a disease? I think you need to think about the unintended consequences of stating it in that fashion. I think if we put the same attention into obesity that we do with other things, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. Lots of people really don't know and don't think through how little some people have to spend a week on food and what you can really buy for that. Even to this day, it still upsets me to find out how many of my colleagues don't recognise obesity as a problem. We need to change the narrative. Obesity is not simple. It's not due to lack of willpower. It's a complex, multifactorial disease that is driven by health inequalities. And people living with obesity deserve evidence-based treatment and empathy for their condition, not stigma. This isn't an insurmountable problem. We can reverse the year-on-year -year increase in obesity. Let's be the first nation to reduce obesity together.